So you want to factor this. So you want to multiply to negative 16, add to negative 6, multiply to the last term, add to the middle term. So essentially we would get negative 8 and positive 2. So this would break up into x minus 8 and x plus 2. And then if you were to set all of that equal to 0, you would end up with x equals 8 and x equals negative 2, which is exactly the numbers that were given. So again, that was much more work than this question was asking. Well, we're not done the question. Um, we weren't required to do that for part of the question, but just as a kind of refresher for these quadratic things, because they come up a lot for our, our um, max and min problems. So anyway, that's how we would find the critical points if they hadn't already given them to us. So now on to the actual point of this problem is to use the second derivative test. So we need the second derivative. So we take the derivative and find the derivative of that. So derivative of 3x squared would be 6x. Derivative of 18x would be 18. Derivative of 48 is 0. So the second derivative test tells us that once we have this, we're going to take the two critical points and we're going to plug them into the second derivative. So if I plug in negative 2, We're going to get negative 30, which is less than 0. We don't really care what the number is, but we just care that it's a negative. So if the second derivative is negative, this is where I always have to pause to make sure I don't say it wrong. So if the second derivative is negative, we're concave down. So we have a local maximum, which is what they told us it should have been. So they were right. On that. And then if we plug in 8, 48 minus 18 will give us a positive 30. Just coincidence that they're the same number but different signs. 30 is obviously a positive number, so we're concave up. We're concave up, must have been a local minimum. Which again, they already told us we were just double checking their work. So that's kind of how you use the second derivative test. You do the first part the exact same way. You find the derivative, you set it equal to zero, find if it's undefined, you find all your critical points. And then just here, instead of using that number line, we just find the second derivative and plug in the critical points. So I'll leave that up for a couple more seconds. Questions, concerns, all that. All righty. Um, like I said, I forgot that we hadn't, we had skipped over that one example last time, so let's scroll back up and hit that really quick. Come on, scroll. <laughs> we had skipped this example one kind of in the middle for the sake of time. So we were asked to find the first derivative number line, so essentially do the first derivative test on this guy. So we have to find the derivative, set it equal to zero. So we've got 3x squared, set that equal to 0. We get that x is 0. There's no denominator there, so I don't need to worry about undefined. So once I have my critical points, I put them on my number line. I pick some test points. I like to put them in a different color. Um, I don't know if I said this the other day or not. Uh, try to make them at least look different. So that's why I also do like kind of an I instead of just a dash because you need to keep track of which ones were your critical points and which ones were just your test points because the test points don't really matter, but the critical points do. And I actually made a mistake in my last class where I said the answer in terms of a test point instead of a critical point. So that would have been bad. That was bad. Um, so we need a point greater than zero, so let me pick one and then negative one. Again, it does not matter what numbers you pick. Pick whatever numbers you want. Sometimes I'll be really obnoxious and pick things like 10 or 100, but anyway. You plug both of those into the derivative. In both cases, you'll get three, which is positive. I like to do my little 
you know, increasing, decreasing love, increasing and increasing again. So here's an example of a graph that has no local extrema. No local extrema. And that's kind of what that theorem right above this example was trying to say is that we can have critical points, but not maxes or mins at those critical points. But if it is a max or a min, it must have been a critical point. So here's an example of a critical point, zero, that did up being a local max or min. So I'll leave that up for like five more seconds and then we'll get another full example of this local max min stuff. Um, I think there's just one more full example. And then we move on a little bit. All right. Nope. Let's scroll down. So where's our next full example? Down here. I need to zoom out a little bit so I write a little smaller and have space. No, wait, that doesn't make sense. Never mind. <laughs> So use whichever derivative test you like to find the local minimum and maximum of the following. Um, I'm probably going to do the first derivative test. If anyone wants to see the second derivative test, I can, but I'll explain why I think it's not our time um, once we get there. But anyway, so as always, with either derivative test, first thing you do is find the derivative and find your critical point. So we find the first derivative. This case is going to be a, uh, a chain rule. We're essentially in a something to a power case. So we bring the power down, subtract one from the power, leave that inside piece alone, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Derivative of x squared is 2x, derivative of 4 is 0. Personal preference, I'll multiply that 7 and the 2 there. You could leave it unsimplified. In the one we did on Wednesday, I did simplify because it just made our life easier for the next piece. For this one, it doesn't really get us anything super simple. Um, it doesn't really help us gain any more time, but I just personally think it's also worth the one second it takes to rewrite it. Anyway, <laughs> so we found the derivative and now we want to set it equal to zero. Algebra reminder. We have two things that are multiplied together. This also works if there's more than two things. <laughs> so since there's a, just a string of things multiplied together, if that thing has to be equal to zero, one of those pieces must have been zero. There's no way to multiply two numbers together and get zero unless one of them was zero or both. So we can essentially break this up into the two separate pieces and just set the pieces equal to zero. So we get that either x equals 0 from the 14x equals 0 piece. And then in the second piece, we would want to take the sixth root of both sides, but that's OK because the sixth root of 0 is 0. Add 4 to both sides. Square root, but remember when you square root, you pick up a plus minus. So we would pick up plus minus 2. Just to make sure I write down that we at least considered it, this is never undefined. Ne Can I spell? Never. There's no denominator here. So since there isn't a denominator, there's nothing to check, so it's never undefined. You don't really have to write that um, if you just can recognize that there's no there, uh, no denominator, so it's never undefined. But I do just want to make sure that you remember that you have to check if it's ever undefined. So I'll take a breather for a second. And so say, what? That's not what I want to say next. So now that we've found the critical points, we get to essentially choose our derivative test, first derivative test versus second derivative test. I personally think the second derivative test would not be great here. First of all, to take the second derivative, I would have to use a product rule that also has a chain rule in it. 
which sounds kind of gross. So I don't really want to do that. <laughs> so personally, I would just say the second derivative is a little gross to find here. So let's just go ahead and do the first derivative test. If you really want to use the second derivative test, you totally could. Um, it's a personal preference, but whatever right, float your boat. We need to choose test points. So I need something between zero and two, so why not one? That's really the only nice number we have there. Between zero and negative two, so maybe negative one. Something greater than two, I'm gonna choose five, just because I feel like it. And I'm gonna choose negative five at the back because I like to be symmetric. <laughs> Again, so that five and that negative five are just personal preference. If you wanna use three and negative three or something like 10 and negative 10, or you wanna be obnoxious and do 100 and negative 100, I do that sometimes, um, but whatever floats your boat. So I wanna leave myself a little bit of space for my little uh, pieces I wanna draw later. So we need to find all of those test points evaluated, evaluate the derivative at all of those test points. So let me just kind of highlight our derivative over here. So we're plugging them all into that 14x times x squared minus four to the six. Now I'm going to show you, um, I guess it wouldn't necessarily be called a shortcut, but remember, I think I said the other day, you don't actually care about what this number is. So there's a way that you can just kind of look at these and kind of look at what the sign of kind of each one of these pieces would be. Because remember, this is essentially two things being multiplied together. One thing that you could do is just think about what the signs are going to be. And then I'll talk about a different way if you don't want to do that. But so say I plug in negative five. I would do 14 times negative five. I don't know what that is, but I know it's going to be a negative number. And then if I plug in negative five to x squared minus four, I'm gonna get 25 minus four, which is positive, 21, but maybe I don't even need to know that number. And then I'm gonna take that positive number and I'm gonna take it to the sixth power. That's also gonna be a positive number. So essentially, if I plug in negative five here, I don't even care what the numbers are, but it's a negative number times a positive number, which is gonna give me a negative number. If you don't like that, don't do it. <laughs> So if you don't like that, just go ahead and plug in negative five. And if we plug in negative five, we will get. Oh my Lord, that's a large number. If you plug in negative five, you'll get uh, this. You'll get that number. <laughs> but notice that that number is negative. So when we plug in negative five, we get a negative. If I plug in negative one, 14 times negative one would give me a negative. I would have one minus four, so negative three, but negative three to the sixth is positive. So that would also give me a negative. Again, if you don't like that, just plug in negative one and find that it would be negative 10,206. So another negative. If we plug in positive one, we would get 14 times one, which is positive. And then we'd have negative three to the sixth power again, which is also positive, which gives us the positive. If you plug that in, you get 10,206. It's coincidence that these are kind of symmetric, if you will. And then if we plug in positive five, 14 times five is some kind of positive number. 21 to the sixth is some positive number, so that would give us a positive. And if you plugged it into a calculator, you would get that long, nasty number again, but it would be positive. Again, that's just a coincidence that those numbers are kind of showing up again. So we have a positive and a positive for the last two pieces. So if I want to draw my little kind of increasing, decreasing pieces, we have decreasing, decreasing, increasing, increasing. So I've run out of space, but I'll just kind of write my answer in this little box. I'll also pause for a second just in case. So now I want to look at all of my critical points, which is why you kind of need to remember which ones are which, because the only things that are going to happen are at the critical points. So let's look at negative two. Well, the derivative is negative to the left and negative to the right. 
it doesn't change sign at all. So that's not a, po a max or a min. So that's just nothing. If we look at x equals zero, it's negative to the left and positive to the right. So it did change sign. So we either have a local max or a local min. And since the derivative being negative means we're going from decreasing to increasing, that would have been a local min. So a local min at x equals zero. And then at x equals two, the derivative is positive and goes to positive. <laughs> so the derivative does the derivative does not change sign. So there's no there's nothing at x equals two either. So there's n nope. There's no local max. And we're done. So the derivative has to change sign for there to be a local extrema. And it kind of depends on how it changes as to whether it's a max or min. Questions, concerns about that? All right. I'll leave it up for five more seconds. If y'all ever need me to slow down, please let me know that too. Don't. Forget that you can tell me to slow down. <laughs> All right, so the next one is the tiniest bit different, but it's using the same idea of essentially the number line piece is kind of what the idea we're going to use here. So we have the value of an investment at time t is given by s of t. The rate of change s prime of t is given in the following graph. So we don't have the original function, we have the derivative. Yeah, what up? So we need to figure out whether the derivative is positive or negative in all of these kind of pieces of our number line. So notice how the negative two, the zero, when the two kind of break up our number line into four pieces. So I need to pick a number kind of in that piece to plug into the derivative to find if it's positive or negative. You get to pick that number. So it didn't have to be five and negative five. It could have been anything greater than two and less than negative two. So I could have used three and negative three. I could have used three and negative seven. They also didn't have to be the same number, but negatives. I could have used 10 and negative 10. I could have used 25 and negative 630. Um, yeah, so the number does not matter. The only thing we care about is, is the result of plugging it into the derivative a positive number or a negative number? We don't care about the full value, we just care about the sign. Welcome. Okay. How did I get that there's no local max? Yeah, so let me scroll up really quick. Um, where's the, the this? No, scroll back down. <laughs> so way back when, when we were talking about, so this was on Wednesday. So to have a local max, the derivative has to change from positive to negative because that means that the derivative, the original function went from increasing to decreasing. So we want to look at our number line and see if the derivative ever changes from positive on the left to negative on the right. So if we're going back to this example, so we want positive on the left, negative on the right. So we look at this, and do we ever see any case where it's positive to the left and then negative to the right? That never happens. Kind of like my first option is negative to negative, which is not positive on the left, negative on the right. And then my next two, I have negative to positive. That's kind of the opposite of what I wanted for a max. So that one gives me a min when it changes from negative to positive. Well, then what about my next option? My next option was positive to positive, which again, isn't positive to negative. So since we never have a situation where it started out being positive and then in the next section was negative, we don't have a local max here. Any more questions before I move on? Once someone starts asking a question, everyone starts getting brave, <laughs> which is fine. Oh, oh, I forgot to turn off the pen. All right. 
OK, then back to this guy. So again, um, so this is a graph. It's the graph of the derivative, not the graph of the original function. So the first thing we're asked for is the critical points of the original function. So remind ourselves what a critical point is. That's where the derivative of that thing is zero or undefined. In terms of our class, when it comes to a graph, we're never going to have undefined. So really, we only care about when the derivative is zero on a graph. We do need to consider it when we have the, uh, the equation, but pretty much for our class, not in general, but in our class, we won't have to deal with undefined pieces on a graph. So where does this function have its derivative being zero? Well, if we have the derivative graph, the derivative is zero here at one, here at four, and here at six. So the critical points of the original function are exactly those, whoops, exactly those values, one, four, and six. The values where this derivative graph is zero. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, I like these. <laughs> and then I want to identify each critical point as a maximum, a minimum, or neither. Well, let's take each one uh, individually. So we'll look at one, and then four, and then six. So remember, this is the derivative graph. <laughs> so at t equals one, kind of what's happening to the left and to the right? If you notice, this graph kind of comes down and touches the x axis at one, but then it just kind of bounces back up. So the derivative doesn't change sign there. It starts out positive and it ends negative. Uh, sorry, ends positive, does not change sign. It starts above the x axis and ends above the x axis. So this one's going to be neither. The derivative doesn't change sign here. And with this graph, what I mean by sign is, is it above or below the x axis? At x equals, sorry, t equals one, it started out positive to the left, but then is still positive to the right. So it didn't change sign at all. So that's going to be a neither. Now for these last two, we are going to have something. Let me try to split it up so I don't run into myself here. So let me leave a space for a classification. Let me think about what's happening at four. So at four, to the left, we're positive, and to the right, we're negative. So the derivative changes from positive to negative. Well, did that give us a max or a min? So in our case of you know our critical point, in this case, we're talking about four. If we were to think about it in a number line sense, the derivative would be positive to the left and negative to the right. So that means that the original function was increasing and then decreasing. So since it changes from positive to negative, that's what classifies that as a max. A local max, but I don't think I could fit the word local in there. <laughs> and then what about at six? At six, the derivative changes from negative to positive. Well, again, if we kind of think about it in a number line sense, if this is at six, then the derivative started out negative and changes to positive. So the original function was decreasing and then increasing. So at six, we would have had a min. So even though we don't have the original function and we don't even have an equation for the derivative, we can still look at this graph of the derivative to figure out whether we have a max or a min based off of essentially, does it change sign? Does it change um, from above the x-axis to below the x-axis or vice versa? And depending on which way it changes, it'll either give you the max or the min. Hopefully that makes sense. If there are any questions, let me know. I'll hold on for a couple seconds. Oh. 
All right. Okay. So that is essentially all of four one. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to find one new definition for four two, and we're going to go through at least one. Maybe we'll have time for two. Um, example of something from four two. I need to talk about um, some stuff at the end, so maybe we'll just get through one example. But anyway, this is the end of four one, and we're now going into four two. So scroll, scroll. Oh my goodness! There we go. Thank you. So, a point at which a function changes concavity is called an inflection point. To test if a point is an inflection point, what we need to do is we must check to see if the second derivative changes sign. Oh my Changes. Ew. Changes. Sign. Positive to negative or vice versa. How we're going to do that is we're going to use a, a sign chart similar to the first derivative test. But we're going to be using the second derivative. This should not be confused, um, so maybe I should write it like this. Do not confuse this. Do not confuse this with the second derivative test. So the second derivative test is for what we're going to do now is for inflection points. They're completely different types of things. So while this uses the second derivative, it's not the second derivative test. There's really no name for this one. It's just finding inflection points. Um, but yeah, anyway. But what it's essentially going to be is it's going to be essentially the same type of process for the first derivative test. It's just that everything's going to be in terms of the second derivative. So we're going to find the second derivative. We're going to set the second derivative equal to zero. We're going to find a number line for the second derivative. So all the numbers we're going to plug in are going to, going to go into the second derivative. So same kind of idea, just purely with the second derivative. So let's do this example. Find the inflection of x cubed minus x. So the first thing we need is the second derivative. So to be able to find the second derivative, we need the first derivative. So first derivative would be 3x squared minus 1. <clears throat> and then the second derivative would be the derivative of that. So we'll have 6x. Set the second derivative equal to 0. So 0 equals 6x. So x would also be 0. Check if it's ever undefined. There's no denominator here, so it's never undefined. And again, you don't really have to write the never undefined thing. I just want to make sure that it's clear that you need to consider it. So we have our point. <laughs> it's not technically a critical point, so I don't want to call it that. And so we're going to have our number line. This is also why I like to label my number lines because the examples, we probably won't see these examples till Monday, um, but there are examples where we have both the first derivative test and these inflection points. So we have a first derivative number line and a second derivative number line. So I like to label them anyway. But we put our, our point on there. And then we choose our test points. And this is the point where you get to pick whatever numbers you like. I'm going to pick. I don't know. 
I'm going to be obnoxious and pick 100 and negative 100, because why the heck not? It's an easy enough function. <laughs> so just to show you that it really does not matter what points you pick, I'm going to go a little weird on this. Take both of those points and plug them into the second derivative. And again, just like with the first derivative test, you don't actually care about what the value is, you know whether it's positive or negative. In this case, it's easy enough for me to find the value, so let me just write down the values. So we have that the second derivative was positive to the right, no matter what number you plug in, and negative to the left, no matter what number you plug in. Now, with the first derivative, I liked to do those little increasing and decreasing pieces. I do something similar for these, but honestly, it's not as helpful, but it also just helps me remember that this is a second derivative number line instead of a first derivative number line. So I'll do them anyway. So this is the second derivative. So the second derivative is negative. That means we're concave down. So let me just kind of put a reminder that that section is going to be concave down by putting a little concave down thing underneath of it. And then the right side, everything greater than zero is going to be concave up. So I'll just put a little concave up piece. Again, for the concavity one, it's not really as helpful. I think the increasing decreasing lines kind of help the max min be recognized a little easier. This one doesn't really matter. But anyway, I put them there just because. So since the second derivative changed sign there, we have an inflection point at x equals zero. Now, the nice thing about inflection points is that you don't need to care about how it changed sign. So with the maxes and the mins, it kind of depended on whether it changed from negative to positive versus positive to negative. And it gave you, you know, a max in one case and a min in the other. For inflection points, it's nice because you don't need to care how it changes. As long as it changes sign at all, it's an inflection point. So the only case that you're not going to have an inflection point is something where it was positive to positive or negative to negative. And let me clarify and reiterate, you do have to check. So a lot of people will get into the habit of just finding points where the second derivative is zero and just calling them all inflection points. It's not always the case. So you do need to kind of use this number line to double check that it does change sign there. Questions, concerns on that? And hold on a couple seconds in case people want to look it over for a couple more seconds. Okay. Yes, Caroline, exactly. So she asked, so it needs to change concavity to be an inflection point. Yes. So if we find this second derivative number line and the, the sign doesn't change, it's positive and positive or negative and negative, that's not an inflection point. It needs to change concavity, so the second derivative has to change sign. So maybe I should clarify that. I kind of just said it, but I'll say it again. So the definition of an inflection point is when it changes concavity. But since the second derivative tells us about concavity, we can find where it changes concavity by finding where the second derivative changes sign. So that's why this kind of method works of using this number line. If we find where the second derivative changes from positive to negative or vice versa, it'll tell us that that's where it's changing concavity. So it'll be an inflection point. All right. These are the last two questions we need to go through. We don't have time today. So what's going to happen is we're going to do these two. So notice it kind of combines the things from 4.1 and 4.2, extrema and inflection points. Um, we're going to do those two on Monday. Um, so things are going to get a little weird. And I apologize that they keep getting weird. I've never had this situation happen so many times where I get way behind where I should be. But of course, this semester is weird. So let me write a couple of things down here to kind of give you an idea of what's coming up. Um, in the last five minutes here. So of course you have your exam on Wednesday. So 
So what's going to happen on Monday is we're going to go over those last two examples. And then any leftover time we can use for you know review questions or anything like that. The review packet. I'm pretty much done it, so that'll be up later today. I have a few meetings after class today, but um, today it'll be up later today so you all can start looking at it. Um, here's where things are going to get a little weird. So your exam. Was supposed to cover all of two chapters two through four. But we haven't covered four, three and four, four. So those aren't going to appear on your exam because we haven't talked about them yet, obviously. Now the other thing is that I don't want to necessarily put them on the third exam either because chapter two through four is all about derivatives. And now after the exam, we're going to talk about um, integrals. So I don't really want to shove four, three and four, four on your third exam either because then you have like you have to study two different types of things where integrals are all kind of the same idea. So what's going to happen is we're still going to cover four, three and four, four. But what's going to happen is four, three and four, four is only going to appear on your final. And then the chapter five and six integral stuff will be on your third exam. But anyway, um, if you look on Wiley. There's chapter four homework because we were supposed to finish four four um, on, by Monday, but we didn't. And again, this is where I also I'm saying I'm sorry that this keeps happening. It's never happened to me before. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to open this for an obnoxious amount of time. So this is going to be open until gosh, when is it? November 2nd. <laughs> Sounds really far away, but it's really not. So essentially what's happening is it's going to turn into essentially the homework for after the exam. Now to clarify that does cover 4.1 and 4.4 on that homework. Sorry, 4.1 and 4.2. So personally, I would suggest trying some of the 4.1 and 4.2 questions to you know, help make sure you have this stuff down for your test. So I'm not saying don't start it. <laughs> um, I mean, it's your choice, but I would suggest at least starting it and trying to go through some of that 4.1, 4.2 material for your exam. But because I don't want to struggle with telling you guys to only do half of them and then putting the rest of them on another assignment, I'm just going to open the assignment up for a long time. So then the four, three and four, four stuff you can then do after the exam once we've actually covered it. So hopefully that makes sense. I know it's super weird. I'm really sorry. I'll probably put something up on Blackboard about it so you can kind of go back and refer to what the heck was she doing? What kind of crazy crap is going on. So nothing's due on Monday. So originally that chapter four homework was due on Monday, but since we haven't covered half of it, it now means nothing's due on Monday. Okay. Nothing to do until November 2nd, which sounds really far away. But again, I suggest doing the first half of it, that 4 1 and 4 2 material, so that you can make sure you're understanding it well enough for your exam. So you're welcome. <laughs> but anyway, so I'll probably put um, that up on Blackboard in an announcement just so that you can look back at it in case you're confused by what the heck is going on. Um, so yeah, your review packet should be up later today. We'll finish those last two examples on Monday and then have some review time, hopefully. And then your exam will be on Wednesday. Um, that's all I have. So one minute early. <laughs> um, feel free to leave. Have a great weekend. Um, if you have some questions, feel free to stick around. I do have um, someone coming by super soon, so I can't stick around too long, but I can stick around for a little bit if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, have a good weekend. See you on Monday. Let me stop recording. You're welcome. Mm.